divorce in the world, with the highest rate of illegitimate children in the world. Families are broken, homes are broken, bodies are broken, brains are broken, but the church isn't broken hearted about it. This man's broken about his own sin. But listen, he says, the bones which thou hast broken. Did you ever break a bone? I told you I jumped out of a burning hotel in 1951 and landed on the sidewalk. I brought my back in three places. This left leg was in three pieces. Both my feet were broken. And at three o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm, in the, uh, I'm in the back alley away there in Chicago. Fifteen degrees below zero. And I'm shaking like this, saying to myself, I'm 4,000 miles away from home. I can't live long like this. A man comes round the corner and he looks and says, what are you doing here? I thought he won't know if I tell him, playing tennis. <laughs> he said, sir, I mean, what are you doing here? I said, you see that flame coming out? I just jumped out of that window. He said, I don't believe you. I said, well, I do. Then he shared his American humor with me. He said, you can't stay here. A car may come round and you'll get hurt. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. Broken legs, broken back, broken feet. I'm going to get hurt. Bring it. And then he said, listen, you can't stay here. I said, sir, I don't want to. <laughs> so he put his hand under my back and his hand under my poor crippled legs and he lifted me and he put me in about two feet of snow. I didn't know how to be refrigerated. <laughs> and then I was in the snow saying to myself, my darling wife's at home and my three boys near am in, the, in a gutter. In snow I can't see the top. And my bones, when he lifted me up, well, when I jumped out the window, you know, I, I gritted my teeth, and I bit my gum on the inside, it was all bloody. And so by the time I went to hospital, I was smoke and blood. And this man picks me up, and you know, my bones were broken, I'll tell you what. You know when you put two electric things together and they sparkle. Well, when my bones went like that, I thought of this psalm, the bones which thou hast broken, God broke them. Why did God break them? Because he insulted God. So God broke the bone of his peace. He broke the bone of his joy. He broke the, broke the bone of his, every bone in him, everything he had, suddenly became nothing. Listen, King David, don't get too serious. Do you hear the people in the streets? Do you know you're just at the top of the charts? Do you know your number one psalm is number one? Your number two psalm, Psalm 24, is going to live forever and it's on the top of the charts. Listen to the people in the streets. They're singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. They sing about your victory. You've subdued the Philistines. You've terrified the Midianites. You're the most superman. Don't be worried that you just did a little indiscretion. That's what we say to him. But he's got something tormenting him. God help you preachers, I pray for you young men, don't fall into the rut American and Canadians and English evangelists have. Preach a month and don't make an altar call, you make it too easy. Spurgeon said he had seven weeks of agonizing conviction. He wasn't a drunkard, he wasn't a moral leper, he wasn't a thief. He knew that he grieved God and the greatest sin in the world is grieving God. Your sin is this, you won't have Christ to rule over you, that's worse than adultery. I'm going to run my own life, you'll run it to hell. And God wants to stop you. That's why he says against thee, the only have I sin. Now what does he say? Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Martha, darling, I don't know if you were a meeting that night, that Wednesday night, uh, there were about 50 people and I, I felt a burden to deliver my soul on Psalm 51. To a handful of people, why not? What do crowds mean? I've turned down three national, con I've turned down three world conventions for next year. I've turned down three national con uh, video uh, 
TV things across the nation. Why? Because folk don't want my message anyhow. I'm not going to talk to folk that don't want it. We're stuffed to the ears. We're so self-righteous we can't hear God. We're so satisfied. You preachers, I'm not a broken heart. Gabriel can find a tear you shed for the lost if he tried. You become a machine. You can recite your psalms. You can recite your sermons. You've done that so often you can do it in your sleep. But here is a man. The most awesome thing that can happen has happened to him. God has forsaken him. And I said, if there's somebody here tonight, nearly everybody left the tent. There's a woman at the back. This sounds facetious. I don't mean it to be. She was about six feet two, dressed in black. The ugliest woman I have ever seen. And I've traveled the world and I've seen some ugly women. <laughs> Do you know how ugly she was? That woman couldn't have won a beauty competition on a crocodile farm. She staggered down the aisle and knelt at a little old bench we had and started to sob. And I knelt at the side of her and I stayed and I stayed and I stayed and finally I said, Lady, I'm willing to stay all night if need be. What's your trouble? My trouble? Mr. Raynell, you've no idea what that meeting meant to me tonight. She said, 40 years ago I was one of the leading officers in the Salvation Army. There were two of us, another lady and myself. We saw revival. We saw the drunkards saved. We saw the harlots saved. It was a joy to live. We hardly got any wage. We were so poor. But oh, the joy when people came to the altar. When one, one woman says, listen, I haven't been with a man for a week and that's never happened in my life. A drunkard said I haven't touched drink and I haven't beaten my wife. And he said, she said it was joy. And she said, one night I got angry. I chose the hymns for the meeting and my, uh, uh, my co-partner came in and said, I've chosen them. Well, I'm going to have my way. You know, I'm having my way. She had her way and I went home. And this is what she said. I took off my coat and I cut it up with the scissors. I took my straw hat and tore it up. I took off my skirt and I cut it into ribbons and put it on the open fire. And when I got my skirt and all my clothes burning, I took my Bible and tore all the pages out of it and put them on and said, I'm through with it. There's nothing in it. This woman's just like anybody else, jealous and proud and selfish. I've always to agree with her or submit. And she said, that's what I did that night. And she says, Mr. Raymond, listen. The moment I did that, the Holy Spirit of God left me. She said, I went to Salvation Army rallies. I heard William Booth preach. One of his great sermons, if thou hast one with a footman and they have wearied thee, how will I do in the swelling of the Jordan? People went to the altar weeping. I didn't. I went to hear Colton, uh, Colonel, no, was it, was it Colonel Railton? Or whatever he was. And Railton was a hellfire. It didn't disturb me. She said, you'll never know till we get to heaven what tonight meant to me. She said, for 40 years I've never heard the voice of God. For 40 years I've never had any joy. It didn't matter what came in my life. I've had no joy. I've had no peace. I've been like a haunted animal. I remember I turned my back on God. I denied the blood. I tore up my Bible. And I gave away my life. And she said, you know what it means to live for 40 years without joy? It's like living in a room without a window. I said, tonight, Mr. Ramiel, the voice of God spoke to me. As soon as you read that scripture, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. She said, I said, Lord, please restore my joy. I know I can't get the years back I've wasted, but give me joy, give me peace. Let me have that adoration I used to have for you. And she said, there at that moment, a miracle happened in my life. It's just as though light came in, warmth of God's love came in, his peace came in, and his joy came in. And she said, Mr. Amy, I'll be like this forever. I stayed on in that church after the crusade. You know that woman never missed a meeting. We had a prayer meeting every Sunday morning, uh, Saturday, Sunday morning at 7 and I went there one morning she's standing up to her ankles in snow waiting for the prayer meeting she got her passion restored she said you know how many there are like me all over our town there are people who walk with God 
You know what you do when you've no joy in the Lord? You take all the entertainment you can get. Whether it's in Canada or America, you turn the TV on. You've lost the joy of the Lord, so you watch people skate, you watch people fight, like the other imbeciles around you. Why do people want your Christianity? It doesn't satisfy you. You put a show on in the pulpit as though Christ is all in all, and you know he isn't. You're playing a double game. You're holy and devout here, you're as worldly as the next. You can roar, watching a hockey match, somebody scores a goal, somebody kicks a ball, you're screaming. You join the devil's crowd, forget it. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Joy and gladness, the bones which thou hast been broken, may hide thy face from me. Notice that. Hide thy face from my sins. Let me skip over here a minute before I come back to this. What does it say? Let me say it again. Hide thy face from my sins. Do you know who this man is? He's the man that wrote the 23rd Psalm. It's the man that said, if I go down to the valley of death, and I think the valley of the shadow of death, Brother Ron, was well, when he went to meet Goliath, it looked as though it was all up, but I don't care, I'll fear no evil, God is with me. Now he says in Psalm 139, one of the most daring things said in Scripture, in verse 23 he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Isn't that something? Dare you open your heart tonight and say, Holy God, Search my heart and know my thoughts. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Search me and try me. Search all my heart, the secret springs, the motives that control, the chambers where polluted things hold empire o'er the soul. Search till thy fiery glance hath cast its light through all, and I by grace am brought at last before thy face to fall. Search me, O God. Notice what it is saying this psalm. Hide thy face. Don't come any nearer. I'm already, I'm, my heart is lacerated. Dear soul, if you're miser miserable about your sin and backsliding tonight, you ought to be happy. You should be the happiest person in the world that God has come to at last. You've had a closed Bible for so long, you've had a closed heart so long, you've not sat and rejoiced except in a meeting. You're a professional humbug. Restore that joy. Put a song back in my heart. Let me know I have a relationship with the living God. Is there anything greater than that? But then it changes drastically. Come back to Psalm 51. Is there anything more horrible than this? Here is a man loaded with guilt and condemnation. What does it say? Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That woman said in 40 years the Holy Spirit never spoke to her. You say, oh, he won't leave you. Listen, he will. He left some of you long ago. You keep up the profession of clapping and going to church and the Holy Ghost isn't there. Do you know what? The most dangerous thing in the world is to be in a meeting where the Holy Ghost is. Do you know what he does? He convicts of sin and it's like a burning iron. He stirs the conscience. He gets down to the memory. He begins to turn the pages back and show you all that stuff that you hid away and nobody knows. He says, hide thy face from my sins. Oh God, don't come nearer in your purity. I'm polluted. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and in your right spirit within me. Verse 11, I'll read it again once. Cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Listen, how near the borderline are you? Look, suppose you die tonight and go to hell. Can you tell God you haven't had a chance? How many times has he knocked on the door of your heart? Huh? What did Theo Monop say? Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be when this vain art proudly said, All of self and none of thee. And then he says in the next stanza, Less of self and more of thee. 
and finally he says none of self and all of thee what are you hanging on to? are you going to die with peace and joy? are you going to die? and people say nice things over we tell the horrible things about people who are dead we lie about them we know they've gone to hell we say insurance open, a certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life it's eternal life or it's eternal death Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, of whom me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. When? When I've been restored. When the joy is coming back. When I'm not preaching a theology, I can preach out of my heart and say, Listen, this unclean stable has been cleansed and God has come in himself. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Now notice in this verse, O God, thou God of my salvation. Notice what he says. Number one, my tongue. Next verse open my lips next line my mouth my tongue my lie my lips my mouth this tremendous combination what did we say last night about Isaiah what did he say bless everybody he said no Lord touch my lips why does this man say open my lips is he dumb no he's not but he knows good it's no good testifying when his life contradicts his lips it's no good saying be pure in heart they say so you're dirty skunk you're dirty yourself you're false I believe the biggest plague in America and England tonight is hypocrisy we're trying to keep up a facade we're trying to persuade ourselves we're totally spiritual we know we're not most of us are trying to live on minimum spirituality and expecting maximum blessings in eternity it won't work open thou my mouth open my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise but listen dear friend when God the Holy Ghost has come to you and shown you corruption and you cried that great hymn of top ladies a brother was saying about he's going to sing at Keswick this weekend I think did I ever preach at Keswick in England no they wouldn't have me I'm not a big shot I preached at Keswick in Manchester I preached at Keswick in London and we went to Orange Grove and there's a church like Westminster Abbey, a miniature it has beautiful gothic uh, windows and doors priceless stained glass windows and they said now Mr. Rayleigh is going to speak and I went and got over that pulpit like that and gripped it tight put my feet there, why? because the pastor in that year's church used to be anyhow in the days of Wesley, top lady he wrote Rock of Ages, cleft for me, didn't he? let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin what? the double cure why do you say a man gets everything when he gets saved he doesn't then you grumble about wretched hypocritical deacons well they're not going to shift you told them to lie that till they die there are two kinds of people in the world not rich and poor not black and white not educated and illiterate just two those who are dead in sin and those who are dead to sin could you imagine going to Keswick next week or some other time or the Keswick in England and saying to that crowd that supports the intellectual rich and uh, people from all over the world actually at Keswick in England and you go stand in front of them and say well friends I've got a wonderful text this morning you're dead do you think they'll shout hallelujah? sure they wouldn't because they're dead <laughs> is that what Paul says? you're dead but your life is hid with Christ in God you know it's a fashionable thing now the carnal Christian that's a lie from hell Romans 7 says to be carnally minded is death how can you be dead and alive at the same time people say I don't know whether I'm saved or not if you were locked up in a room and chained to the wall and the room was totally black no light and somebody came in and smashed the chain off the wall and put the light on they think you'd know didn't Jesus Christ come and turn you from darkness to light if you were carrying a burden a hundred weight on your back and somebody took it off would you know sin is a burden what did Lady Macbeth, Beth, Macbeth say about the blood on her hands this damp spot I think she says all the perfumes of Arabia can't cleanse it 
Listen, there is no place for salvation in any other religion in the world but Christianity. This is where you can become a new creature. You may be in debt a billion times to God for his mercy and you've taken it for granted. But listen, maybe this is the last time God's going to speak to you. What does he owe you? If you die like that and you're at the judgment seat and God says to me, did you preach that message? That yes. Did you tell people all the record of their sin could be cast into the sea? Yes, I did. Why didn't they do it? Because they love the world. They love the little trivial trivialities of the world. But I'm telling you this, listen friend, if Jesus Christ cleanses that heart of yours and that conscience and he comes to abide by the Holy Spirit from that moment, you haven't a minute of your own, a penny of your own, you're his, you're bought with a price. For some reason I was thinking about what I said last night, uh, that, that little mound of dirt opposite uh, Wesley's chapel on City Road, London, and there John Wesley's, no, Wesley's mother's buried over the Lord, I think. No, she's buried there. And Isaac Watts is buried there. There's a wonderful man called George Fox. How many ever read the life of George Fox? He had all the gifts of the Spirit, didn't preach about them. He's a wonderful man of God. He was indwelt by the Spirit. You better be walking with God. He'd come up and say, Hey brother, I haven't seen you for two years. I see the spirit of a serpent in you. Lady, I haven't seen you for a year. I see the spirit of a fox in you. I see the spirit of the deception in you. And he begins to tell you exactly what was there in your heart. He had a wonderful intimacy with God. He wore some leather breeches because he wore his breeches out traveling on horses. Oh, like, it was going through Litchfield. My dear Martha and I have been off, and, and there's Litchfield with its twin towers. And he said, when I got to the edge, the Spirit of the Lord said to me, Son, no, friend, he said, because they were friends, take off thy shoes from off thy feet. And he said, my feet were burning as though I had a fire in them. So I took off my shoes, and I went to the hedge, and I put them under the hedge. And he said, the Lord said, lift up thy hands. I lifted up my hands, he said, walk through the main street, and it was market day. There were cattle over here, hogs and dogs, and over here roots and fruits. And he walked down the middle with his hands up and cried at the top of a voice, Woe unto Litchfield, thou bloody city. Are you prepared for that? I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow, forget it. Put it into action. Go down the street tomorrow, tomorrow night. Instead of going home to watch your lousy TV, go and talk to the prostitutes. Be sure they don't pull you their way. My daddy lived with dukes and lords and ladies. But when he got saved, sat in night, he put rags on, an old coat, a beaten up old hat, trousers that were torn. He stood outside the tavern. When a man came out on his wobbly legs, he put his arm in them. And he took him in the basement and gave him coffee and sobered him up. My daddy was so enraptured with the fact he'd been delivered from the bondage of sin, he could never pay back the debt of love he owed. Okay, so George Fox goes through the town. Every merchant looked up and said, what's wrong with that? Oh, that's that madman. He's a preacher. That's George Fox, the Quaker. George Fox says, I went through town, it was hot, and I felt terrible and joyful at the same time. And when I got to the end of the town, I said, Lord, thank you for strength to do it and the Lord said I'll give you more strength to walk back and do it again so he said I walked back to the end of the town and every he says the butcher came to the door the man in the apothecary otherwise the drugstore he came and all the people started jeering but I had a deep peace in my heart I'd done the will of God I don't know why I just cried thy brother's blood crieth no uh, uh, what did I say no, he said, uh, the Lord said to me, raise your hands and cry as you go through the city. Woe unto Litchfield, our bloody city. The next day he rode out on his horse, and when it came to supper time, he saw a big house. The Quakers are very rich in England. And he went to the house, they said, Aye, friend, come in, thou art welcome. We shall have a meeting here tonight. But supper isn't ready yet. Would you like to go in the library? So he went to the library, there was big old leather back books, and he put his hand up and he just reached for the book like that, and opened it, 
and he opened it at Litchfield and he said Lord what's this Litchfield and Lord said well you came through Litchfield yesterday what did you do he said I walked through with my hands in the air crying one to Litchfield thou bloody city one to Litchfield thou bloody city and you don't know why do you know because on the very spot where you stood in the middle of that ground 200 years ago 200 Christians were martyred and their blood was crying through you if those young people you profess to lead you put your statistics out they were born again they weren't at the judgment God will say their blood is crying to you you never stayed till they got born you never stayed till they got assurance you put them in a false hope They've never, had a sh they've never loved to pray. They've never loved to read the word of God. They've never loved to witness. They do it automatically because the church tells them. Do you think George Fox ever forgot that experience? I've never forgotten it since I read it. All the bloodshed on battlefields is going to cry to God for judgment in the final day. Nobody's getting away with a single thing. Again I say, do you wonder <coughs> that this man comes with joy? God has restored unto me the joy of his salvation. He's touched my tongue. He's touched my lips. He's purified me. I want to go out now and tell of what great things the Lord has done in my life. And that's what the world is waiting for. It isn't waiting for a new twist on theology. It's waiting to see people stand in the street and say, Listen, I was like you. I was as dirty as you are. I was as polluted as you are. Or I was as self-righteous as you are. I went to church for years and never cared whether who people who are damned or not. But now I do. I'm not worried whether I sleep or not, you should say. If I get one night's sleep a week, I'm very happy. I very seldom do. I go to bed at nine, get up at twelve. And pray next two or three hours, usually. My dear wife will come and say, Len, are you okay? Yes. Uh, would you like some tea? So, yes, usually. Oh, in winter I don't have that. I have some nice hot uh, cup of soup, you know, and stay up a bit longer. And I, you know, I'm like the old lady in England. She got up one night and she looked out and everybody in town was asleep. So she said, I, I got up after that always. I always pray, she said, between midnight and one o'clock because God isn't as busy then. <laughs> she forgot the other side of the world's waking up. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, isn't it wonderful? that God can take that twisted warped life of yours God can take that hideous record of sin which he's going to read at the judgment of four millions of people if you don't get rid of it tonight in one act of mercy he can take your record and cast it behind his back forever you've been a backslider you could have been teaching in Sunday school you got too busy some of you preachers could have been somewhere else you've wasted your time and yet he comes in mercy and says listen Tonight I'm prepared to restore you. I'm prepared to restore the joy in your heart, the peace in your heart, the wonder of prayer, the awesomeness of worshipping God. It can be done. What's his final prayer? Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You know, science says in every snowflake that comes down, there's one tiny spot of dust. But when he washes me, I'm whiter than snow. The hymn writer says, Long my sinful heart was striving to obtain this promised rest, but when all my struggles ended, simply trusting, I was blessed. Again, go back to Topladius, intellectual, brilliant man, he says, foul I to that fountain fly wash me say you or I die you think it's a nice job to preach it's the most difficult job in the world every meeting I'm in this the Holy Ghost is there somebody's born and somebody dies you may live ten years after tonight God Almighty never speak to you again why does he have to you've long withstood his grace long provoked him to his face would not hearken to his call and grieved him by a thousand falls you made Jesus Christ weep in heaven, you backsliders. He was been weeping today. And he'll be weeping till you come back. You said no to his blood. You said no to his word. You said no to fellowship. No wonder you're dry and miserable. No wonder buying a new dress doesn't make you happy. 
No wonder buying a new car doesn't make you happy. Christ alone can make you happy. Christ alone can give you peace. Christ alone can prepare you in a moment of time to step out of life into eternity. Come on right now, honestly. At this moment, would you be content to die? Are you so prepared? I believe the rapture could happen at any moment. Then at this moment, you're pure. What does the scripture say? He that hath this what? This what? Hope. Where? Then what does he do? Purifies. But he's coming the moment to twinkle the banana. It won't be time to apologize. It won't be time to get purified. Somebody tells you you're wasting your time. No, you're wasting God's time. Every moment you're in disobedience, you're robbing God of his fellowship with you. You're robbing him of speaking to you. He can't get through. You're so busy, you're so lost in materialism or human natural pressure. This king isn't satisfied with being a conqueror. He isn't satisfied with writing psalms. He says, God, you're afar off. Come near, come near. I'm coming unclean as I, just as I am without one plea. I like the last verse of that hymn. Just as I am poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches of the mind. Yea, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come. Okay, I'm through with one thing. You believe Jesus Christ is coming, as I said last night, okay? What's he coming for? A bride. Did you ever see a dirty bride? In all the years I've traveled the world, in many places, I've been to many weddings, I've seen tall brides and small ones, fat ones and thin ones, rich ones and poor ones, ignorant ones and educated ones. I've never seen, never seen a dirty bride. You know deep in your heart tonight that you're not ready. You know that your heart isn't pure, your thinking isn't pure. You don't have to commit adultery. What did Jesus say? Look on a woman to lust. And you've done the thing secretly. You don't have to steal, you just covet. And you're guilty. There's nothing more beautiful this side of eternity in the eyes of God than somebody who's pure, washed in the blood of the Lamb and has Jesus Christ ruling in their lives. Sin no longer has dominion over them. They're not in bondage to some wretched, rotten, secret habit. They're pure. Every fetter has been broken. Is anything greater? To be free? Where are you tonight? A self-righteous sinner or a dirty acknowledged sinner? Secretly I lust. Secretly I go in shops and turn over the girly magazines and take, you know, cheap looks at cheap things. Stay up late at night. God watched every moment you watch that lousy TV. He's got a record of it in eternity. Won't it be embarrassing? Preacher so-and-so watched so many hours a week. He only prayed three hours in the whole week. He watched t- hour, ten hours, he watched TV. It's on the record. It's going to be read before millions. Get out before judgment comes. Say, from tonight, spirit, soul and body, I'm going to be the Lord's. I'm going to believe there's cleansing for me in the precious blood. Oh, I'm coming back as a, as a, a rebel. I've been away from God. I've kept my, I took communion. I've paid my tithes. But deep in my heart, I'm, I have condemnation. I have guilt. I have fear of death. I have fear of judgment. Right now, I say, Lord Jesus, I don't care about public opinion. Some of you preachers ought to be the first at this altar. You've, you've uh, prostituted your calling. It's just get people here and they weren't born again. They've gone out. They're as lost tonight as they were before you talked with them. You didn't have time to stay. Well, if you don't have time to preach, don't preach. I didn't have a rotten past. I was a good Methodist. But I remember the night when I realized I was a sinner. I couldn't believe it. 
I tumbled out to the altar. Thank God somebody explained the way of salvation, talked to me about true repentance. That's an old fashioned word. And that's why young people are getting saved tonight. They don't repent. They don't put things straight. They just say, oh, it's all right, God's written. No, go back and mend the fences. But listen, there are times when there are sins that God cannot forgive. I just say this and quit. There's a certain woman lives not far from us. She testified on the 700 Club a few years ago. She was a bit of a society girl, very charming, lived for the world, went dancing and singing and all the rest. And I'm not sure whether she was married or not, but she bore a child. Then about three years after, she bore another child to somebody. I don't know how many times she was married. Anyhow, these children became an embarrassment. She couldn't travel as much as she wanted. And so what did she do? She gave them both away. Well, that's all right. It's easy, isn't it? You give away a child five, you give away a girl seven. Now you don't have the responsibility. You just pay a woman to look after them. But listen, that was ten years ago. Now that little child of five is fifteen. The girl of seven is seventeen. You aren't my mother. Where is my mother? Oh, she's a wonderful Christian. She sings, she makes records. A Christian? Is that Christian? But wait a minute. Your mother wasn't even saved then. She was a mother. Why did she desert me? There are millions of people who will never go back to church or anywhere after Swaggart and PTL to spit in your face. Say, look, those were the cream of the crop. Those were men that were always talking about the Holy Ghost and that's how they lived. Listen, let me go back just a minute. I want to tell you this. I believe if you're born again, it's a very difficult thing to sin. Number one, because the Word of God is hidden in your heart. And then the Spirit quickens it and it becomes sharp as a two-edged sword. So number one, you have to fight your knowledge of the Word of God. Then the Holy Spirit is there. And number one, He's going to try and fight to keep you from sin. He wants to keep you from falling. And you resist Him. You strive against Him. And He puts up with it for a while and then you grieve Him. And then He won't stay. When you finish that, He leaves you. You can't get back to God when you want. Maybe you never intended to come to this meeting. God knows you're on the edge of the precipice. You've been grieving the Spirit. You've been resisting the Spirit. Listen, the next stop, like that, you quench the Spirit. You say, you can't do that. That woman said she did it for 40 years. God never spoke. I picked up the Bible. It didn't mean a thing to me. I heard William Booth storm against sin. It didn't mean a thing. Why, she's dead now. If she had Gabriel preach, it wouldn't happen. She's resisted the Holy Ghost. She's grieved the Holy Ghost. She's quenched the Holy Spirit. That's not my word. That's God's word. Do you think I haven't struggled for hours with men that used to be preachers? Preaching in Australia, the man on the platform said, you see, the man up there with a the big head, at one time he could get 20, 30,000 people. He filled the altars at night. He had signs and wonders and miracles. And then he got into sin. He got careless at first. It was just he wanted more money. He wanted to travel. But the devil got him away from the will of God. And that's the key thing. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The will of God is not that you should stay in misery and uncertainty. He's saying tonight, come. Again, uh, I'm serious. If ever God's done anything in the last three or four years, every day I live I go to the judgment seat of Christ. I see my little self standing there and he unwraps everything off me. My ideas of myself, the public opinion about myself. He takes everything else away till he gets down to what? To see if I won the most souls? No. That's the very last thing he rewards us for maybe. He's looking for holy character. He's looking for himself in me. Christ in you. Have I been living in you, molding your character? You're no more covetous than Christ himself. Tomorrow morning I want to give a simple... Bible talk on helps to holiness. But listen, there's a lot of peril in this meeting tonight. You may go home to sleep, I guarantee I won't. Next stop I meet you may be the judgment seat of Christ. 
I'm telling you honestly, it's a terrible thing to be in the presence of God. Take your hands off, he may make you another George Fox, I don't know. I know this, he'll transform your life, he'll transform your vision, he'll transform your asp aspirations and your hopes till sometimes you wonder whether in the body or out of the body. Sure, I spend hours weeping, but I'll tell you what, there are nights when I feel every, everything in my body will burst, I'm so full of joy and having such a communion with God. I don't mind having the grief, what does it say? He gives beauty for what? Well, ashes means something has to be burned up, burns up your self-will, burn up your career, burn up your pride. He gives beauty for ashes. You're looking for joy, he gives the oil of joy for what? Mourning. If you're not mourning for your sin, have you been mourning for a lost world? Have you been mourning for a church that's lost its power? That people go past the thing and say, oh, that's a kind of a religious club. Listen, I'm grieving that God the Holy Ghost doesn't get his way in our lives. I'm grieving that the devil and drugs have dominion over the youth of our nation. And not only of America, over England and every nation in the world. There is no joy this side of eternity like the joy. Jesus, who oh, for the joy that was set before him, is the joy in hanging on a cross, naked? He wasn't covered up, that's part of the humiliation. Is a joy marching through a street with all the thieves and liars and hypocrites and religious people scorning? That's the Son of God. That's the man that's going to build a new world. Look at him hanging on a cross. What was his joy? It's the will of the Father. Didn't bone her right and I'm through, go labor on, spend and be spent, I joy to do the Father's will. It is the way the Master went, should not the servant tread it still. You've not the slightest idea what it means once Christ comes into your life. I was chaplain for two or three years of the largest Air Force camp in England. I took it because I could, I promised to do it without payment. When I went up the hill, it was on a plateau, there's a great big building. It looked almost like a city. It was the house that C.T. Studd used to live in and round it, there's a private race course. His daddy was a breeder of the greatest horses in England. His family was friendly with the royal family. Here's a young man idolized by the whole of Britain. Some of his records have never been beaten in cricket. He got marvelously saved. His daddy got saved, I think, in a moody meeting, was it? And then he got saved. Oh, the whole society pages. C.T. Studd has been saved. He stepped out of it. His brother stayed in it. What's the greatest honor in England? The greatest honor in England is to be the King of England. What's the next greatest? To be the Lord Mayor of London. And so Kinaston Studd was knighted by the King and made Sir Kinaston Studd. And he rode in a carriage like the Queen's. Came to the border of the town. A man in breeches stepped out, gave him a gold key. This is the key of the city of London. What happened to his brother? His brother became a mystery with six other aristocrats. And there he is, in all the pride and glory. Where? In China. They wouldn't let him wear long trousers. He had to wear pantaloons. They wouldn't let him wear a white shirt. He had to wear a shirt down to his knees. They wouldn't let him shave his head. They cut his hair off, made him grow a pigtail. He had to walk. He walked until his feet were split. The man who used to ride round in a carriage. At the end of the day, the other companion says to him, Well, C.T., all my being's ransom powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. And then he goes on to say, Worldlings prize their gems of beauty, cling to gilded toys of dust. That's what your joys are gilded toys of dust, boast of wealth and fame and pleasure, only Jesus will I trust, only Jesus. Let my hands perform his beating, let my hands perform his, what is it? Bidding. Pardon? Bidding. Yeah, thank you. Let my hands perform his bidding, let my feet, they're cracked in two and they're full of sores and dirt, but they're walking a Calvary every day. I don't think of my rich people at home, I don't think of wealth. I don't think of my brother riding round London as the, as the Lord Mayor of London, eating with the King of England, going to the celebrity concerts and everything. It doesn't even do I mind. 
Dear God, he says, I have a home eternal in the heavens. What's this done? That's why when they whipped Paul 295 times, every time they took a slice out of his back, and they did that what? Five times received thy forty stripes save one. That's 295 times they ripped his back open. And each time they do that he says, keep going. I've got a home in the heavens. He bobs up and down in the sea for a night and a day. It's okay. I have a home in the heavens. They threaten him. It makes no odds. I have a home in the heavens. And he tells us seven times. I was in perils of the deep. In perils of the... In perils, perils, perils. What are they? I have a home eternal in the heavens. What is it to go without a bit of bread down here? I'm going to live in eternity. We've lost sight of eternity. We're so bound. Some of you preachers know where you're going next week and the week after. You know how much money you'll get and they'll look after you. Listen, take a risk for God. Step out, not on faith, step out on God. Saying, Lord, this whole life of mine is a failure. I'm totally disgusted with it. I'm tired of mediocrity. I want a passion for the lost. I want to give my life away if I never leave America or leave this town. I want to be a love slave of Jesus Christ. I want to do his will and I want to be purged. Wesley says, purge me from every sinful blot. My idols all be cast aside. Cleanse me from every sinful thought, from all the filth of self and pride. Some of you should have come in broken in that meeting last night, but some of you are too bound, just too satisfied with your condition. Somebody's responsible for making that meeting tie up last night. You're so big a shot, you wouldn't humiliate yourself. And you know you haven't had a fire. You're like the man I mentioned last night, you had the glory ten years ago, it hasn't gone now. You say the same words, the same phrases, people come out and you know, all the time. There is not passionate love. Other things have dominion over you. Purge me. Uh, Brother Ron, come up and sing for us, please. I don't usually make altar calls. I'm telling you this altar is, don't you risk it again. This may be God's last call. Whatever you need is to be saved, you're a guilty sinner, or to be restored, or to be cleansed and fully possessed by the Spirit. Say tonight, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry I've embarrassed you so long. I'm coming now for cleansing and for the anointing of the Spirit. Come as we sing. We'll sing it about twice and I'm through. If you want to take the meat after? sing that verse again and you wherever you are say listen I'm going to pray for these people in a few minutes but I want you to be honest and publicly acknowledge your failure tonight your uncleanness and come and cry to God right here and I'm going to pray for all who come that God will do a miracle that heaven will get excited over this meeting I don't count numbers but God tells me tonight this is the last call on somebody I've not said that I don't think in the last 30 years don't fool around. This is the opportunity. Have mercy upon me, O oh God. Forget about your unsaved brother or sister. You've been walking in rebellion and disobedience. Sing it.
I died right now tonight. I want you to pray very specially now as I'm going to pray. <coughs> a young man just came to me now. He's been in this meeting and other meetings. And he said, Mr. Raimley, Mr. Raimley if I die at this morning, at the moment I'll go straight to hell. This meeting is worth it for that one man as far as I'm concerned. That the devil loses dominion in his life. That tonight he really passes from death unto life. Lord, break every fetter in the heart of this young man tonight. Lord, break every lustful desire. Break every spirit of rebellion in him tonight. Lord, Lord God of hosts, claim these bodies, soul and spirit tonight. Lord, let heaven get excited over people repenting of sin and give them courage to put things right if they're wrong. Lord, now we plead the precious blood. These dear ones want to be whiter than snow and only you can do it. It isn't their repentance or tears, but the blood that atones for the soul. Satan, we defy you tonight. Take your hands off these people. Lord, liberate people. Stench everything in them that craves for God, that craves for sin. Lord, get men and women here who become fiercely loyal to Jesus Christ. People who from this night become love slaves that some of them won't even dare to turn the TV on anymore from here to eternity. Lord, get people you can dwell in, people you can operate, people you can direct, people you can invest your strength and wisdom in. Lord, here's some spoil for your kingdom. Jesus, you died on the cross for this crowd. Lord, I'm glad that fountain is still open tonight. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And it's flowing tonight. Lord, we don't wonder this man cried, Have mercy upon me. Lord, don't judge us tonight. Have mercy. Have mercy on our rebellion. Have mercy on our deafness. Have mercy on our stubbornness. Come with a great cleansing wave right now over this place. Touch every unclean spot, every unclean desire, every unclean happiness. Lord, make all hell mad tonight because people are going to take up residence there for a billion years and not going. They've found deliverance. They have a new master. They have new desires. They have a new heart. They have a new inspiration. Lord, we take it with them by faith tonight. I believe you're walking here and touching us at this moment as literally as though you were here in flesh and blood. And so we agree together, Father, tonight that these people are not repenting from something. They're coming to God, slaves of God, soldiers of the cross. Friends, listen, God is convicting. There are two men who have been to meetings this week. One of them came up a few minutes ago and he says, I'm lost, I'm going to hell. This other man says to me just now, I'm lost, I'm going to hell. Pray for me, I need to be delivered. There's some battles going on here. Let's believe God. Let's stand in victory through the blood. Lord, bring this precious man through to victory tonight. Let him know he's passed from death unto life. Break every fetter. Every fetter, Lord, snap them in two. Lord, let people leave this place, new creatures in Christ tonight. Lord, we're jealous for your glory. Make some of these men leaders in the days to come. Make them soldiers in the greatest battle in the history of the world. Lord, I pray, put the whole armor of God on these people tonight. Make these young people monuments of purity where there have been mon emblems of impurity. Give them new hearts and new spirits and new desires and new longings. 
Lord, we are pleading the blood specially for these two men that have been going to church and even coming here for so long and have been dead in sin and now they're alive, realizing I'm without God. Lord, bring this man through. We refuse to let bondage keep on him tonight. Friends, listen, God is convicting. There are two men who have been to meetings this week. One of them came up a few minutes ago and he says, I'm lost, I'm going to hell. This other man says to me just now, I'm lost, I'm going to hell. Pray for me, I need to be delivered. There's some battles going on here. Let's believe God. Let's stand in victory through the blood. Lord, bring this precious man through to victory tonight. Let him know he's passed from death unto life. Break every fetter. Every fetter, Lord, snap them in two. Lord, let people leave this place, new creatures in Christ tonight. Lord, we're jealous for your glory. Make some of these men leaders in the days to come. Make them soldiers in the greatest battle in the history of the world. Lord, I pray, put the whole armor of God on these people tonight. Make these young people monuments of purity where there have been mon emblems of impurity. Give them new hearts and new spirits and new desires and new longings. Lord, we're pleading the blood specially for these two men that have been going to church and even coming here for so long and have been dead in sin and now they're alive realizing I'm without God. Lord, bring this man through. We refuse to let bondage keep on him tonight. Lord, if need be, give us a dreadful ten minutes right now. Show us eternity, even as preachers. Show us, it, show us our unfaithfulness. Show us how careless we've been in leading people to Christ. We've just get them to make a confession and say a word and nothing ever happened. Bring guilt upon us if we're guilty. Lord, I pray for myself, give me a new passion. If I live five days or five years, give me a new holy strength. Give me a new spiritual intelligence. Give me a new spiritual will. Lord, I'm not just praying these men will escape hell. I'm asking you that, Lord, they'll become warriors in the greatest fight of all in the battle. Lord, we're glad tonight that David's God is our God. We're glad the fountain is open for sin and uncleanness. We're glad, Lord, the sign is over the door. Whosoever will may come. And Lord, we've come. You won't turn us away empty. Lord, give everybody here tonight a new appetite for reading the Word of God. A new longing for obedience to God a new desire to be part of the bride and walk in purity in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Lord, I pray for each of them Wesley's prayer when he said, uh, Less than thyself, O do not give. Lord, don't just give them peace, give them yourself. Come and indwell them tonight. Make them your habitation. Give them that joy unspeakable and full of glory. When they go to their homes, when they go back to their churches, let people see something has happened which is not of man. It's not something men have engineered. God. Well, that's a good confession for an evangelist. I've, I've 
adopted methods, our trusted methods, trusted uh, formulas. Boy, I'll tell you, when you get in a meeting where God begins to shake, it's very different, isn't it? Huh? Your sermons don't look as good just now in the light of eternity, do they? Your righteousness is pretty speckled. Your passion is a very, very tame thing. The dying souls of men doesn't tear our souls. Yes. Yes, do it, Lord. The Lord changes this man, he confesses here, I've never loved the lost, he's loved the world, he's loved other things. Lord, take it all out tonight. If it's love of money or anything else, kill it and replace it with Calvary love. Give him a passion for the lost. Put a holy fever in him to know the will of God. Come on, confess whatever's the obstruction, I'll pray with you. Pray that God will deliver me from worldliness. Well, you can deliver yourself. One thing, kick your TV out. Here's a man has the spirit of worldliness, he says. Well, you get rid of it. Get rid of the sun that makes you worldly. If it's your guns, get rid of your guns or your TV. And tell God you'll walk in purity and holiness. Make up your mind, I'm going to be God's and serve God and do the will of God. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Isn't that beautiful? Is a man thanking God? He spared him till tonight. Thank you for waiting for me. Isn't that amazing? Is another man saying he's been an evangelist, but he hasn't been. He's been living repentance out because it's difficult. That's what we have to preach: repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. Say to the world tonight: You don't attract me. You're a dirty, rotten corpse. I want nothing else to do with you. I'm alive in Christ. I'm a new creature. I'm going to love and adore things that are pure and lovely and of good report. Bless you for confessing that preacher. Bless you, young man. It did my heart good to say thank you, God, for waiting. God could have killed this man this week. 10,000 people, 100,000 have died since a week ago tonight. But this man was spared and you're spared. Be careful. Time's running out. Yes, Lord, we pray with our sister now. She's confessed pride. Lord, help her to take it to the cross. Nail it there by faith. And say, I'm crucified with Christ from tonight. I have no pleasure, no pride in these things. By the grace of God, my eyes are anointed to see differently. Until now, the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen eternal. She's only seen the temporal, the visible. Change it. Lord, let us see into eternity. Let us see the day of rewards. Let us see the wonder of being eternally with Christ because in his mercy he stepped into our life tonight, a life of disobedience, a life that's foul with sin and rebellion. God, we bless you for this tonight. Lord, show us eternity, even as preachers. Show us, it, show us our unfaithfulness. Show us how careless we've been in leading people to Christ. We've just get them to make a confession and say a word and nothing ever happened. Bring guilt upon us if we're guilty. Lord, I pray for myself, give me a new passion. If I live five days or five years, give me a new holy strength. Give me a new spiritual intelligence. 
give me a new spiritual will. Lord, I'm not just praying these men will escape hell. I'm asking you that, Lord, they'll become warriors in the greatest fight of all in the battle. Lord, we're glad tonight that David's God is our God. We're glad the fountain is open for sin and uncleanness. We're glad, Lord, the sign is over the door. Whosoever will may come. And Lord, we come, you won't turn us away empty. Lord, give everybody here tonight a new appetite for reading the Word of God, a new longing for obedience to God, a new desire to be part of the bride and walk in purity in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Lord, I pray for each of them Wesley's prayer when he said, uh, Less than thyself, O do not give. Lord, don't just give them peace, give them yourself. Come and dwell them tonight. Make them your habitation. Give them that joy unspeakable and full of glory. When they go to their homes, when they go back to their churches, let people see something has happened which is not of man. It's not something men have engineered. God. Well, that's a good confession for an evangelist. I've, I've adopted methods, I've trusted methods, trusted uh, formulas. Boy, I'll tell you, when you get in a meeting where God begins to shake, it's very different, isn't it? Huh? Your sermons don't look as good just now in the light of eternity, do they? Your righteousness is pretty speckled. Your passion is a very, very tame thing. The dying souls of men doesn't tear our souls. Yes. Yes, do it, Lord. The Lord, change this man. He confesses here, I've never loved the lost. He's loved the world. He's loved other things. Lord, take it all out tonight. If it's love of money or anything else, kill it and replace it with Calvary love. Amen. Give him a passion for the lost. Put a holy fever in him to know the will of God. Come on, confess whatever's the obstruction. I'll pray with you. Pray that God will deliver me from worldliness. Well, you can deliver yourself. One thing, kick your TV out. Here's a man who has the spirit of worldliness, he says. Well, you can get rid of it. Get rid of the sun that makes you worldly. If it's your guns, get rid of your guns or your TV. And tell God you'll walk in purity and holiness. Make up your mind, I'm going to be God's and serve God and do the will of God. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Isn't that beautiful? There's a man thanking God. He spared him till tonight. Thank you for waiting for me. Isn't that amazing? There's another man saying he's been an evangelist, but he hasn't been. He's been living repentance out because it's difficult. 
That's what we have to preach, repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. Say to the world tonight, they don't attract me, you're a dirty, rotten corpse. I want nothing else to do with you. I'm alive in Christ, I'm a new creature. I'm going to love and adore things that are pure and lovely and of good report. Bless you for confessing that preacher. Bless you, young man, it did my heart good to say, thank you, God, for waiting. God could have killed this man this week. 10,000 people, 100,000 have died since a week ago tonight, but this man was spared and you're spared. Be careful. Time's running out. Yes, Lord, we pray with our sister now. She's confessed pride. Lord, help her to take it to the cross. Nail it there by faith. And say, I'm crucified with Christ from tonight. I have no pleasure, no pride in these things. By the grace of God, my eyes are anointed to see differently. Until now, the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen eternal. She's only seen the temporal, the visible. Change it. Lord, let us see into eternity. Let us see the day of rewards. Let us see the wonder of being eternally with Christ because in his mercy he stepped into our life tonight, a life of disobedience, a life that's foul with sin and rebellion. God, we bless you for this tonight. great. Here's a man who says he's come to the end of the road. That's a good place. You've no confidence, you've no ability. Sorry, brother. Come right to the end of the road and start now new in Christ. Just say, Lord, right now I put off the old things by faith. I take on the new things. I believe at this moment I'm born of the Spirit of God. I want the spirit of prayer and of supplication.